Uh, so we, uh, so we're a film website. We've been going for about ten years, um, but we we love all sorts of movies. So Flash Gordon is one of our is one of our favourites, and because of the fortieth anniversary, and there's this amazing Blu-ray that's coming out. Yeah, and we were so we were so hoping to be over there with you guys in this stupid COVID. You know, we were going to go all throughout Europe and see everybody for the fortieth anniversary. So hopefully, we're postponing it till next year, and we'll have a vaccine. So that was our intent as well as to be over with the fans. Let me tell you. Oh, amazing! We'd love to have had you in the UK. Oh, the film was was a is 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 a big it's a big deal in the UK. It was you know. Yes, it is. We have a lot of British actors and things mm. in there, and director and and um, and I always call it the Wizard of Oz of our times because you just keep watching it. You get more out of it each time. It the colors, the costumes, the sets, everything is so um, fab you know fabulous in a in a in a um, fantasy way that it's just uh, you know I, I i i've seen it 400 bazillion times and i still enjoy seeing it when i watch it so do i so do i i saw it as a kid and absolutely loved it i think it's the vibrancy like you say the colors and the sets and everything and we don't yeah. get we get movies like that now but the kind of authenticity to it of the sets being there and everything kind right. of the camera is 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 such a great thing to watch in that in that film yeah, and Mike Hodges is to be credited with that. I mean, he's the one who really kept it comic booky. Like, you know, although they were very expensive sets and everything, it was still a kind of a innocence about everything. <laughs> you know, it's still a little wee bit clumsy as it was in the in the TV series and also, you know, in the cartoon. And I, I got to give that to Mike's vision. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I I I, I was going to begin just by asking you about the the beginning because I've seen the documentary uh with with sam and all the other guys yeah. that you guys are all involved with so i know a little bit about it but i just wondered what what drew you to it in the first instance whether it was dino de Laurenta seeing you in something and wanting to cast you or whether you kind of wanted to go after it because you you enjoyed the the script or, or what was it a combination of of both well in, in real terms as a young actress starting out anything that comes your way that you take that hopefully you're keeping your clothes on most of the time <laughs> So you grab at everything and, and you know, I was one of hundreds and hundreds of women who auditioned for this and, um, and you know, I certainly like the idea of it, but you know, I, I, even when I started out, I, I didn't put a lot of um, emotional connection with the piece because, you know, you go for an audition, you don't know what's going to happen. So uh, I hadn't even seen the um, comic books until I actually got the part and was in Dino's office in London and he brought out the comic books. And, you know, that certainly turned my head around about what the energy and the theme was, was you know, the motif of, of what the film should be about. So I'd seen a couple, a couple of Buster Crabs, but it's not something that, you know, I wanted to pursue like every role Helen Mirren's ever had. <laughs> 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 I'm sure if you asked Helen Mirren, she would have loved to have been in Flash Gordon. I know. Yes, she has a bit of a streak about her, Helen Mirren, with those kind of things. <laughs> That's true. She's on me. <laughs> um, so, were you? Were you? Did you come onto it when Mike Hodges was director? Because I know Nicholas Rogue was attached to it for a while. Yes, and what's interesting is, you know, Nicholas we, uh, Rogue, we know, has kind of a dark view of, you know, a little bit uh, at, um, nihilistic view of the world. And a lot of that was with Dino. He saw Flash Gordon as a much darker piece. He wanted it to be more like Star Wars. Mm. Um, uh, and ironically, he got a script from a brilliant guy uh, called Lorenzo Semple that was full of jokes and double entendres and castaway lines. You know, most of the lines except for Go Flash Go were in that script. I came up with Go Flash Go myself. And, um, um, and we can talk about that later. But basically, uh, you know, we it was a funny script. And so um, Mike was true to the script and to the story and the kind of send up a little bit that comes with doing comic book movies. And um, Dino was really hoping for Star Wars because it was such a mega success. But the two are, are really polar opposites as far as what they offer the audience. Mm. Yeah, because it, it obviously back in the day there was obviously Star Wars, but Superman had come out a couple of years before, mm -hmm. and it feels more like Superman in many ways. In that it's even though they're different right. properties, that it's very faithful to the material, but has a 
a lighter edge to it, if you like. I yeah, mean, I mean, the whole I, thing's friggin' absurd. A guy flies and we live, go to the planet <laughs> Ming. So we were much, it ha, both of those had a little bit more of the sense of the absurdity where Star Wars was, you know, there really are Wookiees out there. I don't care what you think. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it? I, I mean, they, they, they searched high and low for Sam as well. I know that Flash Gordon was a role that uh, lots of people, I guess, wanted. Lots of people thought yes. they could do, but he wanted someone that was a little bit unknown as well to play the role, very similar to what they did with Superman. Well, part of that Batman. is financial. Uh, part of that was financial. <laughs> <laughs> he was no dummy. <laughs> but he's, I mean, he's, you can't, it's strange now, obviously, there's only been one, one film, but it's hard not to picture him as, you know, to picture anyone else but him doing it. I oh, mean, it, his physique, his hair, his bone structure and his face, you know, he was perfect. Uh, how was it working with him? Because I know, I, I, obviously, there, there was stuff that comes out that I didn't know about that I saw in the documentary. But apart, aside from that, what was it like working with him? Because were you both kind of in this maelstrom of we're just going <laughs> just gonna to go with it and see what happens? Well, you know what I love? Uh, in the movie, there's a scene with, with the plane crashes into Zarkov's palace. And they sort of come out like these little innocent faces. Well, that's the reality of what it was like, uh, uh, you know, is things would happen and we were just going, oh my goodness, what is this? What is this? One of my costumes, they had, um, they initially were going to have Sam when he was in the in the bog with the yucky thing, uh, have a, a hallucination of me as some big green spider or something, you know, and they spent money on the vampire teeth and the costume was stunning and this huge mega uh, spider web behind me and, they painted me head to toe in green and all this sort of vampire green makeup. And I sat around in it all day and uh, it never got shot. I mean, it was just, you just kind of were led by kind of, okay, just show me where you want me to be next. Because it was, there was a lot of chaos there. Partly because Dina would come to the set and have fits and, you know, tell Mike, and Mike, it doesn't look like there's a motor look, you know, this is my flash and all this stuff. And, and, and God bless Dino, he, his vision was not what was appropriate, but Mike, Mike pu pushed it through, man, you know, sometimes to his own exhaustion, but he pushed it through to make sure it was an appropriate vision of Flash Gordon. Yeah, because it's a movie that obviously in the eight in the seventies and eighties it was about not just auteurs but but producers. You know, obviously you know producers of Dino De Laurentiis's thing obviously right. and went and did Dune with David Lynch and there's stories there. You know, oh, guys and P.S. If you want to if you want to check out Dune, check out the sets. They exactly the same sets as Ming's Palace. They use a lot of replicated stuff from Flash Gordon that they. Put I didn't into know Dune. that either. I didn't know about you know about you dressing up as a green vampire and didn't know that you <laughs> in June. You vampire go. spider. Vampire spider. Goodness me. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's something. I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean obviously you there was you too, but there was a there was an incredible ensemble. You had Topol from Fiddle on the Roof, you had Timothy Dalton, who would be Bond a few years afterwards. You had Max Brian Blessed, Max von Sydow from the Exorcist. I mean, it was an incredible cast that was on that was uh, assembled. And, and how about Mr. Rocky Horror Picture Show? And Richard O'Brien as well, of course. Yes, who who we we sort of reconnected over uh, uh, last year, and he's now living in New Zealand with his wife in this wonderful place. But you know, it it was it was amazing. It was sort of like the Titanic because it was six days a week. Everybody was working very, very hard with sort of all this confusion on the set. And we really bonded. I, I, I really want to put this out there. Timothy Dalton was so kind to me because I was there, I was plucked because it was a girl who was going to play uh, Dale Arden before me, a lovely friend of mine, Dale Haddon, who's a model and actress lovely person and whatever happened happened and I had just come to New York for a week and I get a call on Friday uh, morning saying it's Dino and you have to leave for London today because you're doing Flash Gordon tomorrow going and so I came out there with not much I had, you know I had nowhere to live nothing had been organized um, and uh, I was pretty much by myself and pretty exhausted. And when we did have a Sunday off, Tim would have me over once in a while to his house for a little Sunday brunch and we'd just yak and, and he's such a smart fellow. And, um, and he was just really gracious. And, and I lived with Sam and his, uh, his then girlfriend, she became his first wife 
when I first came there because I had nowhere to go and they took me in. So, you know, I got a, a lot of support on just the, the reality of how chaotic the living situation was for me. And then, of course, Max von Sydow is this generous actor who is wearing these mega heavy costumes. And when they do the turnaround, you know, uh, and I'm supposedly looking at him, he was in full costume because that's the way he works. You know, he's, he's, he w was, God rest his soul, one of the most gracious actors beyond being t amazingly talented and clever. <laughs> of course, Brian Blessed, like you just go to the set and you have to wear diapers because you're going to be laughing all day long. <laughs> it's just, it doesn't end. It's the greatest show on earth. <laughs> I did want to ask you about your your costumes not just your costumes because there were some amazing costumes you got to wear obviously you got to wear your your kind of business uniform at the beginning and then obviously when you're on uh when you're in the other in ming's palace and everything else you got to wear these amazing costumes but one question i always wanted to ask you was what was in that green drink that you had to drink was that an alcoholic beverage or was that some sort of soft you know i was begging props to make sure it was alcoholic it was <laughs> green and i was hoping it was creme de menthe but it was some stupid water with sugared water with coloring i was so uh. bored <laughs> <laughs> but but let's just say, let's just say it was creme de month <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i thought it was uh it might have been like an apple teeny or something that was because of the color but i guess they they, they faked it yeah and acting fun. stuff you gotta fake everything i hate <laughs> <It's> it <indeed. laughs> yeah what was your did you have a favorite costume from was it your wedding gown was it the one well i think the wedding gown was mm. pretty spectacular because it weighed it was all beaded bugle beads and it weighed about 35 pounds wow plus that enormous these enormous wackadoo head head pieces that were you know bobby pinned into my skull and um, having to wear those all day but that was was my favorite um, I must say another one that I really loved was the scene where Ornella and I start having our pillow fight on the bed, yeah. and uh, um, which was just a joy. You know, they were the the stump people wanted us to kind of get violent and shake. We're, we're girls. We throw pillows. Come on! <laughs> <laughs> and they worked great with us. Yeah. Did you do many of your stunts? Because there is obviously the sequence when Dale escapes or tries to escape. At least, did you? There was that much, much that you got to do, or did they? Did they kind of stop you and get stunt people to do it? Well, I'm going to tell you, I have ADD, and I'm a bit clumsy. I see. So because of that, I I wasn't allowed to do anything because somebody knew I would get hurt. So there was a stunt girl for the flip, but I did everything else. And it was my idea to go back and pick up the shoes because I was mm. talking to Mike and I said, no girl would leave her shoes behind that are sparkly. Are you crazy? <laughs> and again, these little moments that Mike Hodges let us all add to it because we, you know, we really try to understand our characters and what they mm. would be doing in a comic book um, framework. No, you mentioned about your, uh, well, you've got two of the most iconic lines from, from, from the film, obviously, the go flush go, which I'll ask you about in a second. But obviously, in the in the in the Queen song, your your you know we only have this many hours to save the Earth, etc. It's part of the song. So anytime you hear the song, you hear you hear you. Is that a yeah. strange feeling? And that... trust me, no. What's strange is I don't get one red cent. Okay, that's what's strange. <laughs> <laughs> no royalties, nada nada nada. Um, oh, I think I think it's 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 great, you know and. You know, that was written and that was right in Lorenzo Semple's humor, even the line when I say to Ornella when I'm crying and she says, what is that water coming out of your face? And I say, they're called tears is one of the things that make us better than you. That's all Lorenzo Semple. You know, he, he was wonderful. But what happened in the Go Flash Go scene was they, again, um, had this thing choreographed that was going to be just like a fight. And Sam says, you know, I'm supposed to be an All-American, you know, these little sort of brown eggy kind of things that they they were holding some of the the um uh actors were holding and he, he said these look like footballs why don't i throw them and i'm thinking well if i'm supposed to be the all-american girl i would be the cheerleader right and so we turned that sequence it was not written that way into the football thing and me going go flash go which again because of mike and his generosity i let that uh, motif go throughout the script and let me do it which is just so wonderful yeah I, 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 I'm sure I'm not the only one who loves when you repeat it at the end when the plane's about to, to crash into the into the palace and you, you, you go flash as you run off it's such a great moment it's such a great moment it really yeah. is uh, but I mean the, the, the film 
I mean, there's, there's so much to it, such a richness to it, but it is kind yeah. of not, no disrespect to anybody that made it, you guys or my colleagues or anyone else, but the Queen music and the song really elevates it to another level. When you heard though that for the first time, what was your, your reaction? Well, you know, it's interesting. Tim Dalton and I went to look at um, up the cut before the music was put in. And it was, we we kind of disappointed. It still needed more editing too, but we kind of just went, hmm, it's a bit flat. And then I didn't hear the music until the premiere in London. And the difference and the energy. And fortunately, I had the pleasure of meeting Brian May and Freddie Mercury at Annabelle's back in those days. And um, they were just lovely. And without, I'm telling you that, music was the icing on the top and added to that richness and you know sometimes I'll be walking along somewhere and someone might recognize me and they'll just start like flash ah, and they'll just keep on walking <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> you know what a groovy thing to have as a legacy <laughs> yeah absolutely it's a strange it's a strange scenario I mean I've, I've talked about there about when you saw it for the first time after the premiere and after the film had mm. come out and everything else I mean were you guys um, were you satisfied with the with the results? I mean, obviously, oh, God, you, yeah. can't, you can't influence how many people go and see the movie. And obviously, in the UK, it was a bigger right. hit than it was in America. But I mean, were you, well, were you satisfied? Well, in with all what fairness, you saw? because it was a lot of British people, Universal promoted it much more over there than it, they did. We were huge in in Europe. We were huge in the um, in the East and Australia and New Zealand and and um, but. Universal kind of put a damper on it because there was this conflict with Sam and Dino and drama and they, they just, they did not promote it the way they should have. I mean, supposedly on the Champs-Élysées, they had these like cardboard statues of us, like all going up and down. I mean, oh, they wow. did great promotion, you know, and they, and Universal kind of dropped the ball. But, um, you know, the fact, the fact that it, it did so well in England, I think they also, you know, because I'm Canadian. So, you know, we have wry senses of humor, those of us of the British Empire. You know, the life is absurd. And um, I think they got it. And I, I think for also for besides the lack of promotion in America, I think people still had their Star Wars heads on and might have been expecting that versus the comic book. Because the fact that that we were not even nominated we listen to me this creative that dino De, uh um dino De, uh De, denali denili the one who did the sets and costumes who worked for fellini that's also where his magical visions came in um wasn't even nominated for sets or, or costumes i mean it's just yeah it, it, it didn't happen in america but i mean that's why we love coming to to england so much and to wales and scotland because they go yeah they get it and france you know yeah, yeah it, it's, it is a massive deal over here. I'll be honest with you. I, I remember when I was yeah. growing up about, you know, my dad loved it and my granddad loved it. Uncle, you know, everyone loved Flash Gordon. And it was a shame that, and I guess a shame for you guys. I mean, were you signed? I know there was talk of in the documentary about the sequels and stuff. Were you signed up? Yeah, to, I mean, the whole ending was set up as a sequel. Yeah. You know, that mysterious red hand, i.e. Mings, taking the ring. So he was still around. And there were supposed to be sequels. Um, I think because America did not as well as Europe did and whatever risks were going on, you know, politically were going on and um, they, they turned away from it. And it was unfortunate because we could have done at least three more. With all these especially there, especially back then with sequels <gasps> being quite big commodity. Well, they are now anyway, but back and, in the day, and, they were and, and it, it, there's so many great comic book stories of Flash Gordon out there. There's so many we could have adapted. Yeah. I, I was sad we didn't do at least two more. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you, you mentioned there about the the hand at the end, which I loved as a kid. You know, you get the you get the oh, what are we going to see a, a sequel and everything else. But then in the documentary, Peter Wingard said it's his hand that picks the ring up, not Ming's. It's Clytus's hand that picks it up at the end. So there's there's lots of fan discussion online as to who it oh, is. Oh, ab absolutely. And you know that just adds to the fun and the community yeah. the spirit. You know. And, um, you know, I, I, the fact that people are even talking about it, like I'm 5,000 years old now. So, <laughs> yeah, it's been 40 friggin' years that, that this, and it's still lasting because of the quality of, of this film. And, and as you say, the complexity, you know, on so many levels, it's great for kids. It's got the double entendres for adults. It's visually amazing. The music is to die for. So there's so many areas that it hits 
and audiences for them to connect with. And, and there is this community and, and who the hell knows when you're out there just acting, you just do a job and you go back, you go, you know, you're on to your next one. So yeah, cause you have to make a living. <laughs> I so, think a lot for fans as well. That question mark is quite powerful. The question mark, the end oh, of question mark is so powerful. And it's so unanswered. <laughs> yes. And it was supposed to be an answer and we were supposed to do at least two more. And I was very disappointed that it didn't happen. That's, that's such a shame. Well, it's been yeah. 40, it's been 40 years and obviously comic book movies have changed drastically over, over the years, you know, obviously, at the end of the 80s, we had Batman. In the 90s, we had more superheroes. Now it's almost like every week we get a new superhero movie. But there seems to still be for young audience, new audiences and old audiences, this pull to Flash Gordon. I mean, have you been surprised just how many new audiences and new generations are discovering this film and liking it just as much as, as we did back in the day? Well, I, I sometimes I get pissed off when someone comes, well, my grandpa and I watched this when I was little. <laughs> I, but that's why I say it's like the, the uh, Wizard of Oz of, of our times, because it just lasts. It's, it's a perennial, you know, like um, uh, Wizard of Oz. And um, I'm, I'm really, you know, again, you have no idea when you go into a job what's going to happen. But I, I, I really am so excited and proud that people took to it because it's beautiful to look at just in it and the music and then the performances and every level it's top drawer did you did you uh, just before I, I let you go uh, but did you did you have were you told anything or did you have an inkling as to what was going to happen in the sequels or what might happen to Dale because at the end the other unquestioned un, not unanswered question was the presumption was they went back to zero there we go because the presumption is they go back to earth but a lot of people hoped that they would stay where they were <laughs> i have no idea but in the comics once saw old flash was in space he was in space forever mm. <laughs> so it would have been more goofy wild space stuff which would have been wonderful to see what the creative pe people would have come up with yeah so um yeah i think it's very unfortunate there weren't at least one or two sequels to yeah because it, it deserved it yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, that's my question because Dale says she's a New York City girl, but then people think, well, is she not going to be happier? You know, it, you know, run a, run a I know. <laughs> what are the answers to these questions? <laughs> so, but that, that think, que the question mark. I think is we so should powerful. have. I think we should have uh, Dale and Flash come back in their sixties and tell you all the things that have been happening all these decades. <laughs> well, my final question was, and it was kind of a, a two-handed question, was are you surprised that someone hasn't remade Flash Gordon in a modern day, not modern day setting, but with modern day technology and made a kind of a new version? And B... No, 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 no. Because they made that stupid TV series, which yes, was in modern did. times, and again, lacked the fantasy quality mm. of it, you know? And it's been in a lot of hands with some very talented people, but it's like, you know, would you remake Wizard of Oz? It would never be the same. There's only one classic version. And mm. I think that's what I'm very proud of is we have one classic version. And you know, you'd, and so many of these um, comic book things that are coming out now are so, they're so, they're X-Men and they're very dark and, you know, very dark colors and everything. Um, and I'm afraid that might happen to Flash and all the, the silliness and fantasy stuff would go and that would not be a good Flash, Gordon. Yeah. And my final question then is, what's your, what's your fondest memory? Do you have a, a particular moment on set or, uh, you know, one of your costumes or anything that's your kind of your, your favorite memory that you'll always kind of keep with you for, forever? Hmm. So funny. Max von Sydow comes to my, my mind and just being able to sit literally because he's he was you know a thousand feet tall at his feet <laughs> and just hear him talk about what it is to be an actor i mean i felt like i was in school with him and just you know and i had such respect for him and watching how a gracious actor male or female works on the set as a professional i think that was just so exciting i mean how who gets that that chance not many people yeah 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 it's a shame he's not with us now because i'm sure he would have loved to celebrate the 40 years with us and that would have been a fantastic person to Can talk to imagine? about I mean... <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. amazing uh, uh melody thank you so so much for thank your time you it's so been much, an absolute Scott. pleasure Good talking luck. to you ladies and gentlemen you're watching hey you guys
Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey!